Ladies and gentlemen, let's start our next session for the day. It's the most awaited one. Uh, the session for the day is on Dolby Atmos for Music in the AV Industry by Shrijesh Nayar. He's, the, he's, at, he's an audio certified audio application specialist at Avid Dolby. It's my honor to invite Mr. Shrijesh Nayar. He has an experience of over 20 years as a sound mixer in the industry. He started his career as an assistant sound re-recording mixer in Rajkamal Studios and has worked on more than 200 movies since then. He was a part of the first Dolby Atmos mixed theater installation in India and the first Dolby Atmos premier mix room in the world. Shrijesh Nayar has won the 60th National Film Award for the best re-recording mix final mix track for the film Gangs of Vasipur and done quite a few art installation in Paris and in Mumbai with artists like Shilpa Gupta and Ranjivan Ayappan. He is currently working as a solution specialist at Avid. Mr. Sirijas, please take the stage. Check, check. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's pretty incredible to see everyone after a gap of three years. This is my first public talk after the uh, last one that I did at Palm. That was, I think, 2018 or 2019, I think. And uh, now I know what uh, uh, artists feel like when they say that the shows have started. You know, it truly is an honor to see all of you. And thank you all for coming and making it to the session as well. So um, there's been a couple of changes that have happened in the immersive world um, over the last couple of years. And uh, what's very interesting about this particular session is uh, a, a, a couple of sessions later, you'll have one incredible talk with uh, Shantanu, KJ, Farhad, and all of them talking about the bang opposite of what I'm going to say right now. <laughs> it's, it's fun, trust me. But that, there is a huge difference in that, and you'll understand with both of these talks why you need both of them. And what we're going to talk about today is one of the most um, uh, challenging parts of any immersive mix. So if we start off by looking at this, <coughs> um, can we switch the? So this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about uh, binaural mix fundamentals. And I'll tell you why. I mean, don't get worried about the term binaural and what it means and all of that. We are going to do. Uh, you know, like with all of my talks, we're going to break this down in a very uh, conversational language. We're not going to do any technical things, but you'll understand the technology behind this. We'll talk about spatialization, why that is important and what difference it makes and how the industry and how the technologies are evolving uh, in the coming times. And the most important thing that we all want is tips and tricks. I mean, it's good to learn technology, but what do you do with it? <laughs> right. So we'll go through tips and tricks as well in that sense. So. The first thing to understand is, how do we listen to audio? And it's also important to understand what immersive audio is. Immersive audio literally means that term. It is immersive, which means it can happen from all around you, and it can happen from above you as well. So this is where things start to get slightly complicated. Like, when you, how do we listen to things above us? How do, how do we know if something is in front of us or something is behind us? And how do we listen to all of this? We have, I mean, Dolby Atmos can go up to 64 speakers in a theater installation. Can go, NH, um, NHK can go 22.2. Um, with the Atmos for Home, you can go up to 22 speakers as well. And then, at the end of the day, we have only two years. So how is all of this going to be translated into that? That is one part. So if you look, we've got AirPods Pro, we've got the headphones, we've got Atmos soundbars, we've got home theaters, we've got concert halls. And when I say concert halls, that is also an immersive experience because there are multiple ways you can approach any kind of a mix or any kind of a listening experience. It can be right in front of you, it can be around you, and the right in front of you versus around you are basically just different experiences. And this is the key word that we need to go back to, David. It is all about what the listener needs to experience. And based from that, you can actually have a hybrid uh, mix technique of you know, surrounding them versus uh, the concert hall or the front in the front mix co combinations as well. And I'll take you through the logic uh, of all of that. It's very important to understand how this works logically rather than you know, just saying, you know, do this, do that. 
and concert halls, and of course, that's Blackbird Studios uh, uh, as well. You know, they've got a lovely looking room as well. So, and if you think about this, like headphones are there, and we all know that we, I mean, it's, it's an iffy thing. Let's make it very honest. You know, certain binaural mixes are good, certain are, some of them are not, and you know, uh, some of them, some of us like to mix in headphones, some of us require speakers. Um, the, a lot of audio files require speakers. There are different kinds of headphones. We'll break through all of this and understand what, when, where, why, and how. Right. So this is the uh, fundamental thing, although. Whatever we do, it has to come through this, right? Do you agree with me? Yeah, but this is also why it is so complicated. There are just so many different kinds of ears that are there. You know, your pinna shape is different. Uh, your tube is different. And it is, here's the other interesting thing. What do you think we listen with? The brain, right. But what all, where, that's actually the right answer. So if somebody asks you, what do you see with, you don't see with your eyes, you actually see with your brain. It's the information that is passed in from your eyes. But what are the sources for the brain? What do you think? This is one. Any other? Sorry? Correct, but from where? No, I'm asking for the direct input sources. That's exactly what reaches the brain. You're right. Here. Exactly. So the ear, the head, the torso. The torso is very important as well. And th this is also why there are different kinds of measurements for binaural, for the, uh, for the binaural uh, HRTF. We'll get to what HRTF is. Because if you skip the torso, the way you hear things is going to be completely different. And here's a good example. I mean, if you mix with a jacket and if you mix bare skin, they're going to sound different. If you mix with a cap and if you mix without a cap, they're going to sound different. As you start losing hair, your mix is going to sound different. You know, so, you know, <laughs> I'm talking about myself here. But uh, when I say sound different, I'm not saying they sound bad. I'm just saying they sound different. And that's because each one of us has a personal experience to sound. The problem here is, or the biggest challenge here is, what is good? Good is a very, very relative term. What is good for me if I love you know, gore metal, I may not like the other side of uh, the spectrum. I may not be a jazz fan. Does not mean it's bad. But we'll come to all of that and we'll see this. Now, this is where things can get uh, slightly debatable. So we're going to talk about headphone mixing and what are the advantages. And if you really think about the advantages of headphone mixing, they're actually incredible. For example, it's a controlled listening environment. <clears throat> right? The moment you put on your headphones, wherever you sit is a sweet spot. <clears throat> Everything is controlled around you. There is whatever is supposed to come to your left ear is coming to your left ear. Whatever is supposed to come to your right ear is coming to your right ear. There is no way you can go wrong in, in that sense with a headphone listening environment. The sweet spot won't change. If I wear my headphones and if I walk across the room, if I sit straight, if I turn left, if I bend, if I stand, it doesn't change. However way I listen to it, I'm always in the sweet spot. Right? So this is the other one. So signals intended for each ear are delivered only to that ear. And that kind of a signal flow is actually called a biphonic signal flow. So you have stereo, binaural, like you have monophonic, you also have biphonic stereo uh, signal flow. Biphonic is, means it's a, it's a clear divide. Whatever is going to go to your left ear will go to your left ear. Whatever is going to your right ear will go to your right ear. There is no crosstalk. Now, this is something that happens with speakers. So you have two speakers. If you follow the ITU method, they'll be 60 degrees apart. What comes from the left speaker hits both your left and your right ear. Right? What comes from the right ear hits both your right and your left ear. Everybody with me on this? Right. Which means there will be an energy increase right in the center spot because this is where these two will cross. Everybody still agrees with me on this? Yeah? But do you know what changes, what causes the difference in the energy for each person? It is the size and shape of their head. So if your head is slightly bigger, the angle of incidence will actually be more front. So it depends if you have a long nose, it's going to be different. If your ears are in, if your ears are wide, they're all going to be different. And here's the interesting part. Depending on that, the amount of vocals that you actually keep in a mix will go up or down. And that's why every person listens to a lot of things very differently. So you can, and not just the vocals, the, the entire low frequency spectrum right in the middle, because what I'm t telling you right now is a very important thing a couple of slides later. The low frequency spectrum that happens right in the middle portion is also very important. 
what is also interesting is because of this crosstalk, you will actually have notches that happen from 2K onwards. There are these notches that happen. And we are all used to that. Each person is used to that in a slightly different way. Okay. When you mix on a headphone, you don't have this crosstalk. When you don't have this crosstalk, that energy bump is not there. When you don't have that energy bump, how you place each and every instrument will be different. When you place each and every instrument to be different and it is played back in a different medium, it will start to sound like you'll, you'll hear a dip in the center, which was not intended to be there. So how do you control that? How do you look at that? That's a very logical uh, thing that comes from uh, the headphones. This is also very important. There is a lot of acoustic isolation in your headphones, right? Your headphones can be as isolated as they can be. You're not subjected to external noise. Because the problem with external noise is when the sound is propagated from the speaker, these external noises actually add to that. When they add to that, what happens is it actually smears the imaging of your sound, of the placement of your sound. See, we can all agree upon what a tonal quality of an instrument should be. There are two ways. There is, a, there is an artistic way and there is an engineer's way. Correct? There are two different aspects to a tonal quality. Right. But how do you decide on the placement of this? How far should it be? How close should it be? How much to the left? How much to the right? How do you define this and where do you judge this from? There are two kinds of placements. There is a, there is a relative placement and there is an absolute placement. We'll come to that as well. It's a, it's a very interesting mixed technique also. And because there is an acoustic isolation, it, it's, it, you know, you're not subjected to anything outside, which means what you're hearing is what you're intended to hear. Everybody with me on this? So this means that tomorrow we'll all start mixing from headphones, right? <laughs> but no. <laughs> because it can be absolutely bad. And you can have an absolutely fantastic experience on the headphones as well. We've all been through that, right? I mean, we've all heard really, really good mixes on headphones, and we've all heard really, really bad mixes on headphones. I mean, I know from my mixes, I know <laughs> that they've been bad on certain. So the question is, what causes this? There are a number of factors that come in, that actually are in play for this, and we look at this, and this is how you can actually logically take this into your mix stage. So let's look at some of the uh, the challenges we have. It actually is an unnatural listening environment. You are not used to listening sounds like this with total isolation for a, for a longer time. Like, we are not used to staying in an anechoic chamber, right? So we are completely not used to this. And everything comes back to the first point I said. It's all about the experience that you deliver to the listener. It doesn't matter how, what you do and everything. If the, if, you know, if the song is really good, it will actually connect to the listener. And that's why the old songs that are there still have a lot of relevance in our lives. You know, whatever the quality may be, quality is very subjective. How do you measure quality? By the number of clicks and pops, by the HF levels, by the low versus high. There is no standard. There is no number. Uh, and you know, if you, some of you were there for the uh, Netflix one where we were talking about loudness, you'll you'll see how difficult it was to arrive at a number for something that was very subjective, right? So it's an unnatural listening environment. It is a very difficult thing to, uh, to continue with that. This is what everybody would have experienced. It's called inside the head locatedness. It's a fancy word. But the problem is this. When you place your headphones, where do you think the vocals or the kick stays? It's inside your head. So whether you move around, whether you talk, whether you, whatever you do, it's going to be inside your head, right? Do you know the other sound that stays inside your head? It's when you talk, when you have a conversation. That is the only other sound that your brain understands is inside your head. There is no other sound that the brain will realize is inside your head. Because you've been talking, you cannot hear yourself from there, right? Unless you have a speaker, you're talking to a mic or something. It is very weird if you start hearing yourself from an outside position. You're always hearing yourself inside your head. This inside your head locatedness actually causes a lot of fatigue. It is a very unnatural position to hear. And also, if you listen to how you, if you play stereo mixes in your headphones, what is the pan method? It's this way. It's very linear. Right? Occasionally, you might get things going up. But what about the front? There is no way you can address that. And I'll tell you why. 
we have something that's called that's called the cone of confusion it's a very interesting thing so if you have something that is right in front of you right or exactly in front of you the uh, the uh, the azimuth is 0 degrees which is right in front of you so it will arrive at both your left and right ear at the same time right you agree with me if this same sound is behind you at the same position it will still arrive on your left and right ear at the same time right so how do you decide if something is front or back what is the method to understand I mean, in the real world, you can take it from what comes, where it hits your head, or where it hits your forehead. But here's, an, here's a very good example to negate that. If you take your finger and start tapping your head, you will hear the sound only in one position. You will hear your skin feel, but you will hear the sound only in one position. You can't find out if it's here or here by listening to the sound. It's very difficult. So how do we... How do, uh, as humans, how do we get across? So let's say this is how we logically get across this. And this is another technique you can use in your mix so that this is where you will understand how much of it can be, how much of your mix can be statically positioned and how much can, of it can be moved. So if something is right in front, the way we understand it is right in front is if we tilt our head. So if I tilt my head to this side, it will hit this year first and this year later. Whereas if it's behind, it will hit this year first and this year later. So we have a method of tracking the sound using our head position. So head tracking is another important thing. This is why you'll understand why Apple also has head tracking implemented in their um, you know, music uh, things as well. So inside the head locatedness is a, is a big thing. Fatigue by isolation. If your headphones are totally isolated you are, you're not hearing anything from outside, you will go into a fatigue because we are all used to hearing noise. In the absence of noise, it'll be mentally very difficult for us to control all of these things. So if you take into consideration all of this, and at the end of the day, we want to give, see, no matter how we mix, no matter which all are the best studios that we mix, what you can get out of that is an incredible output, an incredibly good sounding audio mix. But then the question is, where is the, where is the end user going to listen to this? You know, most of them, a majority of them listen to this on earbuds, on earphones, headphones, and that is because communication is a very uh, active thing. So you can have this and you talk as well. So you need to, at some point, cater towards the, the greater uh, number of people. Because when there is more number of people is when this actually becomes interesting. That's when you can actually sell your work, right? I mean, we can't expect everybody to be an audiophile. But at the same time, we should also not mix for the lowest common denominator. That is absolutely not a given thing. So we'll, we'll figure out about this. So what is binaural audio? So we know what stereo is, right? It's a left and right uh, set of sounds. So when you take a left and right set of sounds, and on that, you impose spatial cues. So what are spatial cues? Your distance, your height, your positioning. When you start imposing these things, it becomes binaural. And that particular kind of a file format is called a binaural sound. Time, intensity, and spectral correlation that mimic human localization. This mimicking human localization is where things are very, very um, uh, challenging. So in fact, even right now, the theory that we are looking at for a pr predominantly long period of time is a duplex theory, which means which is the um, uh, inter interaural time delay and the interaural uh, uh, level delays, uh, level difference, interaural time difference and level difference. And I, I'll again explain that on how you can use that to mix your pads or any bass heavy versus HF heavy things uh, that are there without compromising your center position. So this is how we we look at localization. So if you look at this, for a high frequency, what happens is your head will create a shadow. So when your head starts to create a shadow, what it does is it will look at level difference between this. So when the moment you start going for higher uh, frequencies, the way your brain map, maps out these two things is using level. It's, it is not using time delay. It uses time delay only for low frequencies. And the reason for that is the low frequencies can actually wrap around your head. They'll go through you. There's no shadowing that is being created. So when this was initially being tested, they were using sine waves. So with sine waves, they found it was around 1.4K, was when the transition happened. But we don't listen to sine waves in real life. We listen to music. We listen to very complex audio, right? I mean, if it was all sine waves, it would have been the easiest thing in a gig, right? 
you know, you have a bunch of sine wave generators and you're, we'll all be very happy. We'll all be vibing to a 1K tone. But that's not the fact. We listen to very complex audio. So when we started, when they started uh, looking at this at complex audio, the, uh, it was roughly around 4K where the transition happens. And this is where you need to look at these two different kinds of pan techniques. So if you use a pan pot, like right, we use a left and right pan pot, right? Everybody of us uses that. That's actually a level-based panner between your left and right. So logically, if you think, the most effective thing with using a pan pot is for anything, for any high frequency based content. The positioning in a high frequency based content using a pan pot and just levels is, is, is actually really good. And the reason for that is a lot of our transients are also above this. See, one of the, one of the things that we judge for a good mix is the amount of transients we have. Like, you know, we all say that this is a really good hi-hat, you know, the kick sounds so good. But if you start rolling off everything from the HF, you know, it no longer sounds good. You know, it seems very odd. We are all looking for transients. And that is why in, in most of the uh, recent uh, loudness specs and all, you will have these, these, um, uh, these spacing for transients. There's a, lot, there's a lot of leeway for transients. Transients is always what makes your um, sounds look good. I mean, if you go for any of the speaker demos in the in the room opposite, and you start listening to this, the first thing you'll you'll probably wonder is like, you know, dude, that snare sounds so good. Oh, the hats, the hi hats sound so good. You know, how many of I mean, the bass guitar may sound good melodically, but when you're listening to a speaker, you want to look at the attack and the things like that. So when you do a level based panning, it's always good to look at things that are slightly HF, so tambourines or you know, if you have pads that move into the HF space and all of that. So how do you do a delay based panning? So a delay based panning is actually quite simple. So if you put a time delay on, on your stereo track and you slightly delay one of the channels that is there, you effectively create a delay based positioning. So your ears will, will look at it as an interaural time delay based thing. So if you delay the right side, the image of that stereo track will shift to the left. Everybody with me on this? The image of the stereo track will shift to the left. But here's what is really good about this. The image shifts to the left. It is the image that shifts to the left. There is no gain change within that audio itself. So that track hitting your compressor, hitting your processing things down the line, will maintain that stereo level coherency that it has. You're shifting the image. When you start shifting the image like this, this is actually a huge thing to understand because then you're actually taking care of the, the speaker crosstalk that is there. When you start shifting images like this, you can start controlling your low level signal. And that is why I said, when you look at low frequency elements versus in the time delay domain, in the, in, when you start panning uses time, you will have control over the low frequency elements right in the front. And when you start clearing up things in the front, you have enough space for your vocals. And vocals are also quite, diff quite interesting because, you know, how many times have we been on a phone and we've asked the other person, are you on speakerphone? Pretty much all of us, right? But the phone is mono, and you're hearing it from one ear. How did you judge distance? You judge distance based on not just the reflections. Even if it was not reflective, you can still judge. You can still say that the person is a bit far, right? And that is something that is very unique for speech. The way we judge distance with, spe with, um, with speech is not just the reflections, not, and not uh, just how the levels, but it is also how the person speaks. We are very attuned to that. When the person is a bit far, they start shouting. The pitch goes up. We are very attuned to those things. Which is also another trick you should use when you start placing vocals in your mix. On if you want to create a lot of dynamics in your mix with a slight movement on this, on the higher pitches, just push it a bit far. Your brain will still connect to that. Your brain will still connect. But there will be enough space to place all of your other instruments, instruments in this. So, this is all good. That is all on the horizontal plane. But what about the vertical plane? That is one of the most difficult things to have. See, even for us, the only way we can make out something is high up above us is if there is a physical thing that is playing back that sound <laughs> above us. That's a very difficult thing to achieve with two, uh, two ear pods or a headphone or things like that. But one of the things that has been noticed is there is actually a notch that goes across. So depending on if it starts here and goes up, the notch starts at 5K and goes all the way till 10K, depending on how the position is. That's a very interesting thing that was found out. And the notch also varies. So for example, uh, in one particular 
position, you might have the notch at 8K and not at 6K. In a different position, at the same height, your notch will be at 6K and not 8K. Because until this time, we've been only been dealing with three degrees of freedom. We're looking at up, down, left and right, or basically the yaw, yaw is this, then the pitch and the tilt. This is what we've been looking at. But what about the X, Y, and Z? Where are we standing in relative to this? You know, there is also an X, Y, and Z position that is there. So that's the six degrees of freedom. In fact, when you look at your mix, you have to look at both of these things. You, you decide the position and you decide the X, Y, Z position. When you have a combination of this is when you bring the listener into the natural listening space. And that is why when you start panning your elements, when you start panning your elements, you have to decide whether it's near mid or far, whether it's front left or right, whether it's top and how top and how bottom as well. And there's, there's a lot of tricks in that as well. We'll, we'll get to that also. And the tricks all come from this one. We have a huge problem with localization. It's as, as people, we find it very difficult to pinpoint sound. So here's a good example. Um, when, you're, when you're listening to sounds, okay, and you have to estimate the distance of somebody talking or the, you know, something that is there. Let's say you're in a forest. You know, I gave this example the last time, but this example is in a different context. It's the exact same example. Let's say you're in a forest, you're standing there. You hear a tiger growl in the front. Okay, we know it's a tiger, fair enough. We can estimate the distance also. You know, we're good with that. And the next thing is you hear a twig, a twig breaking somewhere here. The twig breaking somewhere here is actually more scarier to you. It will actually trigger more adrenaline than just the tiger. Because with the tiger, you know which way to run, you know how far the tiger is, you know how much whether you need to stand still, although I don't know if it works. So there is this thing. The problem in the twig is you don't know what caused it. And the second problem with this is, and this is a technique that you should use in your mixes to a great degree. When you have anything that is outside your field of vision, our estimation of the distance is actually wrong. We estimate it to be closer than what it actually is. That is always the case. When something is out of your field of vision, you will estimate it to be closer than what it actually is. So here's a good, uh, good thing for you. And this, this distance estimation is also a very handy tip to have. When you're mixing in surround, when you're mixing in, in 7.1 or Atmos or whatever it is, the moment you start leaving your field of uh, uh, vision, right? In, to make something prominent, you don't really need to boost it in terms of levels. The only thing that you need for it to be prominent is either transients, uh, even if you want to push it back, feel free to push it back. But for the listener who's listening, we are used to this because we are the ones who are pushing it back as engineers. We are the ones mixing it. So we'll know what we're doing. For the first time listener, they'll never be able to estimate that distance, which means you will have space for the other instruments to play in. You'll actually have a much um, uh, spaced out and a much broader mix spectrum just by using these simple techniques of what, how we listen to things in real life. Now, this is a very interesting thing. Pan speed, and trust me, I've gone bonkers on this pan speed. If you, if you've seen Gangster Vasipur at the last moment, uh, you'll you'll understand all of that. Um, so we can go really fast in terms of pan speed. All of that is fine. We can do it to tempo and all of that. We can snap things to positions and all of that. But there is actually it has been measured in how fast you can pan and how fast if the like the faster you pan, the error of finding the position actually increases. So 360 degree per second is doing a whole rotation in one second. Yeah, 360 degree per second. At that point of time, the imaging of that particular element which you're panning is actually off by around 21 degrees. 21 degrees is almost this wide. It's off by around 21 degrees. Whereas if you pan slower, you have a bit more accuracy. This is very important. So if you want to create space in your mix, if you want something to be noticed, what is the first thing you do? You, you pan. But if you leave it static, what will happen? Your brain will decide to mask it. The cocktail effect will start to come in, right? The cocktail effect, you want, like when we're all talking in a room, you can still hear a conversation of the other person. The cocktail effect will start to come in, the brain will start to mask that. But you still want it to be prominent, so you start moving it. How fast do you move it? Is the movement, uh, does the movement actually require the positioning to be very accurate? Like if it's a tambourine or a, or a cowbell, I leave it to you. 
you know, cowbells are, we're never enough with cowbells, right, in songs. There's always more cowbells that we need. But again, you know, don't pan the cowbells. It'll be very difficult imagining a person running around you with a cowbell. So, um, but these slight movements are very interesting. And when I say 90 degree per second, that's, uh, that's this, this pan, right? In this pan, if you pan that slowly, you can still have prominence to this particular thing. You don't need to push it up in front. You don't need to bring it up in levels. It is there where it needs to be. It'll hit your compressor the right way. You know, your two track mixes will sound great and you'll still able to be able to hear it. Why? Because you're tricking the brain into saying, look, I'm here. Oh, if you didn't see me, oh, I'm here. Oh, no, 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 I'm here. You keep tricking the brain into doing that. Okay, so now some fancy terms. Uh, we, um, we need to go through a bit of these fancy terms as well. And I'll tell you why these are not that fancy terms, but these are very mm, useful terms. What is HRTF and HRIR? You know, these are good things. So the HRTF on that headphone is not sounding right. We may have to check the Fourier transform. That statement is absolutely wrong. <laughs> okay, there's nothing, there's, you can't build up a statement like that. It is equivalent to saying, oh, this cake tastes so red. No, the, it's grammatically right, but uh, <laughs> there's no meaning to it. So what is an HRTF? So HRTF stands for Head Related Transfer Function. Okay, it's a transfer function. What is a transfer function? It's something that transfers, that transforms one thing into another. That's a transfer function. That's what the TF, transfer. It's a function that transfers this thing to that. When you do a bank transfer, there's a transfer function. You, you give some money, it gets converted into a different currency. It's a transfer function. What is a transfer function related to? Your head. So, so something that is related to your head, it's a head related transfer function. So what are the components that make up this? Your head, your pinna, your torso, these are the different things that make this up. So they'll get, the, what they do is, now, have you all worked with convolution reverbs, right? Like all T verb and all of those things, right? They have an impulse response that is there. So the way it works is you put an impulse response, you know what the original signal sounds like, you know what the, um, the, the, the processed signal sounds like, you take the difference, you'll get what the reverb is, correct? So you put an impulse, you record that output, the difference between this is what you need to process. So instead of that impulse, if you put a drum, if you put a vocals, you know, you get this reverb. That is a, and it's a, uh, that's what the impulse response is. This is also the same way. They'll make you sit there. If, you're, if they're making your measurement, they'll make you sit there. You're not supposed to move, because the moment you move, it'll start smearing the images. They'll make you sit there. So what, nowadays they've got head tracking as well. They'll start playing impulses and they'll record what is happening. There are two different kinds of recording. There's a uh, uh, blocked meters, which will basically block your ear and not allow any external sounds. And there's another one that will insert a tube into your pinna, into your canal. <coughs> so then they'll play left, center, right, left surround, right surround, left back, right back, top, front, top, back, and all of those things. They'll play. And they'll figure out what the measurements are. Now here's where it is actually very good when it comes to an Atmos mix or when you're binauralizing something. You get these point measurements, right? Between these points, it is mathematically calculated. So from here to here, if the change is so much, this is how the change will go. That is what happens in a binaural renderer. Now, when you this this whole thing is based upon frequency. When you talk about head-related transfer, it's only based upon frequency. But we also have phase associated with it. We have distance associated with it. That is when it is called an head. It is called a head-related impulse response. That is when you have space and time and all of that associated with it. Now, why am I talking about this? As an engineer, why do I need to know what HRTF is and what is, because now you have personalized HRTF, which you can import into your Dolby Atmos renderer as well. Why am I talking about this? See, a lot of us, when we um, uh, mix Dolby Atmos for music, we have these different modes. There's a off, near, mid, and far, right? Uh, if you're not aware of it, there are these different uh, spaces that are there. So when you have off, it's just there. It's like an anechoic chamber. Then a near, now the values that I'm about to give you, I don't, I haven't seen them published anywhere, but I believe they are on one of their patent papers. So the near is a room that is, that the sound is 25 centimeters from your head. The mid is 1.5 meters from your head and the far is around three meters from your head. This is the distance that they have currently, I, I believe they have currently in the renderer. This can change, the distance can change, the room parameters can change, the room reflections can change, a lot of things can change. This little thing is called a binaural room imp uh, impulse response. So what they do is they take your HRTF, which is basically they assume how you listen. Oh, by the way, 
there's another very interesting thing about the HRTF. Most of the HRTFs are measured using an European Caucasian thing. So if you're dark skinned, you know, it's, it's a bit different. So that is why personalized HRTF, I'm, I'm not talking about this, it just happens to be that the mannequin was designed based on that. <laughs> so there's a lot of interesting things when it comes to audio, right? So this is how, so what it basically does is it takes the signal, it puts this impulse response on top of that and gives you the output. That's how this thing works. Now once you know how that works, you will know exactly what you need to look for when it comes to listening to audio in this space. But we've not really spoken about distance till now. How do you know if, if the sound is, if it's right in front of you, how do you know if it's there, here, here, or here? Right? And here is another very interesting thing. Our whole perception of positioning, this is a very interesting thing to understand. Our whole per perception of positioning is very effective if you are mixing in a near field environment. When you go far field environment or midfield, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the midfield, but I definitely know for far field, what happens is the positioning starts to smear slightly. Your mixes will tend to sound big. And any of you who've mixed trailers or, or things in OTT and takes it to a bigger room can vouch for this. You will have, your mixes will sound bigger in the bigger room, not because it's a bigger room, but because the image will start to fold over each other. And that is there. The most accurate positioning you can have is in a near field. And the measurement for a near field speaker, in fact, if you look at our listening range is 20 to 20K. It can go from 1.7 centimeters to 17 meters. You can't keep a speaker 17 meters away. So the, uh, the assumed near field distance is one meter from you. And most of these headphones work around that. They, they put things in a very close proximity from that. So this is what I was saying. You have an absolute distance and a relative distance. And this is very important. Once you fix an absolute distance, this is how you can start. This is how, I mean, this is how pretty much I work with my mixes also. I have an absolute distance, which is probably the anchor point. Let's say my, my vocals or my kick or my snare. Oh, whatever, that is the absolute distance. Everything else is a relative distance from that. I have something that needs to be focused. And this is, again, very important because everything that we hear is only made up of our earlier experiences. Everything, if you hear a snare, if you hear a bass guitar, if you hear this, if you hear that, they're all taken from your past experience of how that must have sounded in that space, which is why these spaces work. I mean, I have not seen the, the concert halls of Vienna. But when I, when I put the impulse response, I think, OK, it feels like that. It might, it might be this big. I have no accurate reproduction of that. So if everything that makes you sound, that you pick up is from something that you've heard, this is actually a huge opportunity for the sounds that you have never heard. For example, when you're doing electronic music, who decides how the synth has to sound? There is no a priori for that. There is no previous experience of this is how the synth will sound in that space. No, that's a different experience altogether. So what you're actually be able to give to the listener is a mix of what they've heard and a mix of an artistic implementation of that. A mix of what I think this thing works, uh, uh, sounds. There you can break conventions. There is where you start to break conventions. You start to push things away. You start to get things closer. You can make it a real space with a non-real space and a hybrid mix. Once you start doing that is when people tend to listen to this over and over. I mean, of course, the music has to be good. I'm not saying, no, you can't, you know, if you polish, you all know the saying. There's only so much you can polish. So it has to be a good music. But these are all things you can do as an engineer. Your positioning, your techniques, your, your panning position, your delay-based uh, distance, your distancing, your movement, everything can be done in this way. So this is a very important thing. If you want to look at distance, so if you, if you have omnidirectional sound, which is like sounds that have no direction, it's just big and there, to make it f double the distance, you have to have drop it by 6 dB. But if it's a line source, like line source, like if you're doing sound design for films, for example, traffic is a line source. Right? To make traffic sound further, you don't need to drop it by 6 dB. 3 dB is fine. Hey, here's another example. You're, you're sleeping at home, right? It's nighttime. You can hear the clock tick, you can hear the bus go. What makes you think the bus is further than the clock? Why do you think so? If you start measuring this, the bus is louder than the clock. 
So if you go by logic, something that's loud should be closer to us, right? If you go, then what are we looking at? We are looking at a priori. We are looking at what we know, what we've heard. We've always known that the bus is far. And this is why when you're put in, in, a, in a forest with a place that you have absolutely no idea of anything, your distance uh, judgment starts to waver off. That's why you think things are closer to you, why you want to be safe, you want to be secure. And you can use that in your mix. Don't make them feel safe. You let them be on the edge and then make them feel safe. Then again, be on the edge and make them feel safe. <laughs> now, these are all things you can do in, in terms of your things. So this is what I was saying with, with, uh, with um, familiarity. You have to be familiar. Now, here's another tip that you should take back with the term familiarity. How do you make a listener familiar to something? You have a song. It's only going to be five minutes. You're not going to take the whole day to make them familiar with the position of something, right? Before you start moving anything, before you start moving anything, keep it static for some time. Establish that and then do the movement. Because once you establish and then do the movement, you will understand that you don't have to do a lot of tweaks with the fader. You will not, and you know, the less amount of time you spend on faders, the, the better you will feel. You know, nobody wants to mix a song for three days and then have 90 versions of it. You all know why Andrew Sheps came, so came up with Bounce Factory, right? So, establish something. Even in a good film, right? You establish the plot and then you grow from there, right? So, establish the position of something and then start moving it. Now, you remember, I was talking about earlier, we were talking about the vertical thing. You know, when you take something vertical, the notch goes from 5K to 10K, depending on the position that it is there. A very good idea to do that is as you take things vertically, you have a really good opportunity to slightly change the send levels of your reverbs for that. Because that will be a very good estimation for height when it comes to binaural. It's very difficult to get uh, height in binaural. These are some techniques that you can use, and this is all logically coming from how the way we listen to things. And this is what, in a way, um, Apple does. So, I mean, there are two parts of this. Virtual loudspeakers. So, for those of you who have an Apple iPhone and you listen to Atmos music on an Apple, you will know that it sounds very different from what you listen to the same song on an Android phone or Tidal or something like that. And the reason for that is Apple virtualizes this. This part, this virtualization of an existing mix is called spatialization. This is what a spatial mix is. This is why it's called spatial audio and not Nolby Atmos. Spatial audio means it is taking a mix. It will convert your mix into 5.1.4. Okay. It will create a virtual space of the 5.1.4 in your headphones. It is virtualizing that. So it decides this is where those speakers will be. This is how far it will be. The difference between virtualizing or uh, spatializing something and actually mixing in binaural is in terms of the low frequency response. We've all seen these notches that I've been talking about. The mo these near, mid, and far is actually made up of a low cut and a high boost. When something is static, it is a static EQ that is there. It is a static positioning that is there. You don't have access to the distancing that is there. So you may find that the moment you do a mix in Atmos, you take, you take it down, you take a radium, and you start listening to this in your iPhone, it may sound a little bit bass heavy. And that is why you need to look at those things. And it's very important you do a mastering process. If, if we have time, I'll talk about that. Otherwise, you can just ask me about that later. There's a, there's a very interesting trick to that as well. So how do you take off with uh, uh, the inside head locatedness? Is A, by panning. B, by having the position cue in that. And if you really want to get access to the front, it can only come with head tracking. Now, the problem with head tracking re uh, nowadays is it's, we are not used to it. I, you cannot say that that is where I think the speaker should be. For each person, if I like the speakers to be here, and if they decide the speakers are to be here, we'll not be comfortable with that. Plus, head tracking is, is a very, it's a, it's a very advanced thing, and Apple has done a really good implementation of it. So once you enable head tracking, and once you start listening to this, you'll actually hear sounds right in front of you. But remember, the, the goal of this is all about the experience that they need. And again, this is very critical, right? How will we choose our headphones? What are we going to choose it on? So you have circumoral headphones, which is like around the ear. When it's around the ear, remember, you remember we were talking about the HRTF a bit earlier? That's the property of your ear, right? There is also an HPRTF, which is a headphone RTF. 
The headphone RTF depends on the kind of headphones, the DA conversion, your playback um, uh, quality level, the cable levels, and all of that is taken into consideration. The moment you cup, the moment you cup, you're, you're creating a bass buildup in that cavity. It sounds are anyways external to you. You're, build, you're creating a bass buildup in that cavity. See, the thing with all of these headphones is if you want to mix on headphones, you should get used to it and don't change it around. Get a pair of headphones, get used to it. If it's good for you, it'll be good for your mixes. You see, that is how you need to approach. If, if it sounds good to you, it sounds, your mixes sound good to you. That is the point. The other equations come in from an artistic perspective. Or they may want the hats higher or the vocals brighter. That's a, that's a different thing. Right. Then you have over the top, close back, uh, open back. So open back headphones um, uh, are really good. It will not uh, induce um, uh, fatigue. Why? Because we are not shutting ourselves out from the external noise. That's very important as well. Plus, there's also a lot of bass dissipation that happens in that, in that sense. So when you're not fatigued, the moment you start fatiguing, you start pushing up your upper mids. Why? Because we all understand the Fletcher Munchen curve, right? Yeah. So the Fletcher Munchen curve shows a, a, a huge bump in the 3 to 6K region. That's, and, that's, and you know why the 3 to 6K region happens? It's because our, um, uh, the cavity in our ear actually resonates in that frequency. It's got nothing to do. And fortunately, we also end up talking at that frequency. I, either it's a beautiful thing of evolution, or we're just damn lucky. I, I don't know what that is. And uh, here's, a, here's another very interesting thing. The length of your ear can only support up to 4K. Then how are you going to listen to 5K, 6K, 8K, 10K? You have parallel neurons firing. It's, it's, it's a lot of tricks you can use to just trick the listener into all of this. So you have in-ear headphones. You have earbuds. The problem with earbuds is your entire spatial cue, if the fit is not right, your entire spatial cue will go for a toss. The bass response, the positioning, the smearing, the transients, everything will go for a toss. Uh, it's, it's there to listen to the music as well, but you also need to appreciate the engineer who's put in this, this, this whole amount of effort to make sure it sounds good, right? Otherwise, we could just do an offline bounce and you know call it a day. And this is uh, another thing. So codex, why are codex important? Codex make the songs sound different. Actually, this is what causes the difference between what you hear on Apple and what you hear on Tidal or other, or on your Dolby Atmos um, uh, soundbar. So, I mean, I'm not going to a lot of details in this, but there are essentially two different kinds of codecs. There's an AC4 IMF, which is basically what also has the binaural part of your mix embedded in. And there's an EC3, which is uh, basically using a, a 5.1 version of that with the overhead um, uh, uh, parts in it. And that is what Apple uses. And the reason Apple uses that is so that they don't need to have two or three, I'm assuming they don't need to have two or three different kinds of protocols to be able to you know, have one for your headphones, have one for your you know, home theater and all of that. They can just take one, virtualize it for your headphone or just give it out directly for your home theater speakers. This is why you need to master your songs. And today, uh, I mean, Apple has publicly stated that uh, spatial audio is one of the fastest growing mediums that they have. See, it's always an open debate whether it sounds good to you or sound doesn't sound good to you, or the songs are good or bad or whatever they do, it's a farce or whatever. Le leave that all aside. If you leave that all aside, it's the fastest growing thing. If it's the fastest growing thing, you are able and, and if you're able to give something that sounds really good to a majority of the listeners, I'm not saying all, to a majority of the listeners, that's really good business. That's really good business. And one of the things we currently lack in, in our space is mastering for Dolby Atmos. We all mix, but then, you know, we're all, if we all do our stereo mixes, we all tend to master because we need a se second um, set of ears and, you know, things to smoothen it out. Mastering for Dolby Atmos is actually a huge business opportunity. Why? You have very strict uh, loudness requirements for Atmos. You need to figure out what happens in a gapless play. You need to figure out if the songs sound good when you listen to it as an album. You know, you may be listening to it as track-wise, but it needs to sound good as an album as well. So all of those things are also quite important, and it's not too difficult once you understand all of these little things. So this is the last section, and this is also what is uh, very important to all of us. So I spoke about the first one. Uh, it's about how do you pan when you're using low frequency. Um, uh, when you're using low frequency elements, you can use the 
precedence trick, which is basically putting a delay and you know delaying one channel or the other. Also, okay, now here's another thing. How much can you delay? Right? I mean, you can't delay one channel by five seconds and leave the other one. It'll be a completely different music that you'll have. So it's around 0.7 milliseconds is what we use as, as the human hearing to distinguish positioning. Right? Uh, binaural audio also relies on creating crosstalk. Why? Because that's very real. That's how we listen to things in the real world. In the real world, there is no signal that comes only to your left ear. There is no signal that comes only to your right ear. It is impossible. So when you look at crosstalk, you need to look at controlling your low frequency. And what one of the techniques of controlling low frequency is, is the precedence effect or the delay-based panning. And you'll also know how you can use an MS compressor if you're using that. Again, be very careful with an MS compressor and a binaural thing because there's a lot of other things that can mess up. But if you're looking at individual positioning stems, individual tracks, an MS compressor is a really good thing to look at. Um, high frequency elements have a shadow when panned behind. This is also very important. This is the one that I said. When you pan things behind, the HF actually drops, but then we seem to be more attuned to that. So we tend to give it more importance. This is also why in the loudness measurement, the surrounds are boosted by 1.5 dB in the measurements. They're not taken at zero. So when you're panning things in the surround, you can be a little bit more OK with the HF parts. You don't really need to uh, keep it that bright compared to what is coming out of the front. Again, we need to, this is the one that I mentioned. So familiarize yourself before you start panning. Familiarize the listener with the position before you start moving it. And the reason for that is if it's an electronic sound, like none of us know how a hi-hat will sound from here. Right? We've never heard a hi-hat from here, unless you are standing on the stage below and you're looking at this this way. So familiarize them with that. And if it's, if it's a sound that is already established, if it's a sound that they already know, Establish that and then change it. So that will give you a lot of things. We spoke about the Apple one. We spoke about the pan. Again, this is what I was saying. Place the audio for a few bars before you decide to move. So whenever you start your mixes, rather than you know just starting on rotating the entire thing all around you, so and you know making them feel as if they are you know tied to a fan, don't do that. Establish the plot and then tell the story. Then you start moving things. Then you can bring things closer, push them far, take them up, bring them down, do all of those things. So that's what I wanted to talk about until now. I've crossed about five minutes across. So I hope this was very useful for you. And uh, I'm so happy to see everyone. I mean, it's been three years before I actually stood on a stage and had this uh, talk. And I'm so happy that you've been very patient enough to sit and listen to me rant about these things uh, as well. If you have any questions, please feel free. Uh, do we have time for questions? If we have any questions, then we have a mic. Sure, sure. We'll pass on a mic to you. Yeah, hello. All right. So I have a very uh, 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 important question over here, because uh, in Atmos, when you mix, and I've heard a lot of Atmos music because uh, 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 it's available online now, okay? Uh, I'm a big Atmos fan, I am. There's no two ways about it. But when you hear some of them, all right, especially uh, things which you are used to in, 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 two, in, in two channels, I would, I would say two channels rather than stereo, and you hear the Atmos mix, many a times there is a low frequency issue that takes place, which should not be there, all right? But it does happen. I understand that the kind of space in which the uh, mix has been done versus, as we were pointing out earlier, the place where it actually plays is the is a client's home, okay? Is a very, very different environment. Does this happen because many Atmos mixes are used, uh, made using headphones, which I, which I, consider personally to be a very flawed way of doing things. It's an extremely flawed way of doing things. So does that happen because of the excessive use of headphones in the early Atmos mixes that you saw coming out versus an actual controlled environment with a proper set of loudspeakers? Is, could that be the cause? Right. So just before I answer that, the, uh, the place where you're hearing this, and that's, that's an Atmos room with 7.1.4 speakers, right? 
5.1.2 or 7.1.4. It's, it's not headphones. You're not comparing it. Not at okay. all. What you observed is bang on. And this is exactly why we need mastering houses and this is exactly why we need big rooms and I'll tell you that. When you mix on headphones, you're, you're essentially listening to a binaural rendered version of this. When you listen to a binaural rendered version of this, there is the HRTF, there is the BRIR and all of those processing that is applied on top of this. This will change the spectral coloring of each of the elements. So for an object or for a bed that is near, mid or far, the, uh, a lot of times when you hear this in your headphones, they're actually brighter and that is because the far uh, spacing or the mid spacing actually has an HF boost and a low cut. In, in within that BRIR, that is a, the room impulse response. So when you do the entire mix using only your headphones and you never check this on speakers, this is exactly what happens. Because when it goes to speakers, there is no more, the, the room impulse response is not taken into consideration. You're just playing back the signals as they go. Now, if you remember, when you're listening to headphones, there was a low cut and a high boost. When you play back on speakers, this does not exist. You'll end up having a slightly low, uh, low heavy mix, which is there on speakers. And if you take this in parallel to what you hear on Apple, Apple generally has a low heavy mix. It's, it's a lot of it has been changed in the recent times. It sounds much, much better now. But what you said is bang on. And this is the reason for that. It is because of the BRIR. I, ha I mean, I don't know. Other people with questions, if not, then I can ask. So my other question is, to many engineers, because I come from the other part of it. I come from the installation part of it, in the integration part of the whole thing. Now what happens is that stereo or two channel as a game is selfish. It's one seat, the guy on the seat, a woman on the seat is the winner. Everybody else is a beggar. The fearsome thing, and I've been doing following surround sound right from meridian days. So right, right, right into, uh, 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 guess, 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 what is, forget the guy's name in the 90s, you know. Uh, what, 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 what I'm trying to figure out is that where does Atmos stop behaving, becoming even more selfish? You, you're getting my point because the fear is that Michael Gerzon, yeah, so when Michael Gerzon did that, okay, the person who sat in the center in Ambisonic, the seat became even more selfish than the stereo listener, you know. <laughs> so, in my experience in Atmos, when you do it in a house, so everybody has a fancy studio, so I've heard some really fancy Atmos recordings, okay. They sound fantastic when you're at the center. The minute you go off center, because that guy has done it in a controlled environment, you're even bigger, bigger than the two channel. Hmm. You know, so how does an engineer in the future translate that an Atmos mix is more social, hmm. more leftist rather than being a capsule rightist in this entire That's scene. a very good, that's a very good Yeah, question. because you know, it, it becomes a very rightist focused thing, you know, yeah, yeah. so that's why, that's a question that I have. Because in so, the house, things change very dramatically from a control room. Right. So when it comes to Atmos, uh, when it comes to the room design as well, you can actually change the, uh, the critical listening area uh, versus what you have in a stereo field. Atmos actually offers you a wider listening area. And it's interesting that you talk about Michael Gerzon because if you have the, uh, this is a self plug by the way, if you have the latest version of Pro Tools, there's actually a, uh, a preset that I built which is based off the Michael Gerzon fold down method in, in that, which takes a 5.0 into a wider stereo. Anyways, coming back to this, there are two approaches that is primarily there for mixing in, in any immersive format. I mean, even if we leave Atmos, there's an egocentric method and there's a, um, uh, there's the other one. Leftist method. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the egocentric method is basically um, uh, mixing for you, for the person that is there. So, you are the star of this. You know, wherever you sit, you are the star of this. And the other one, I, I forget that name, but the other one actually requires an anchor point right in front. When you have an anchor point in front, it makes sense for you to have a wider listening area because if I'm sitting here, if, if the kick is here, if I move here, the kick is still here. The problem with stereo is the moment you start changing your position, you're actually changing in terms of the 3 dB law. You know, you'll have earlier fields of arrival and all of that. With Atmos, you actually have speakers that addresses this. So you're playing back from point sources. 
In this way, Atmos definitely has a bigger listening area. So you actually have a bit more leeway in that. But there is, like everything, there is always a, a, a threshold beyond which you can't go. Like Cash seat. Not necessarily. If you're too close to the surrounds, then there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing. Yeah. And, uh, oh, which brings me to another very important trick as well, uh, which is a good thing, which, uh, which I should mention, I think. So thresholds also exist for reverbs. When you're setting reverbs and you start pushing this up, there is a point beyond which your signal and your reverb will become the same. You know, that's the distance. When you cross that distance, your ear does not make out the distance based on the levels or anything. It makes it out only from the transients and the loudness in that. So you know, that's a good thing to keep in mind as an effect if you want to take. But that's a good question. I mean, this is the answer for that as far as I know. In an Atmos mix room, are multiple subwoofers better front back or front, front down back, rear top up? for a mixed room, because in a home we, we have to do that, because it's not one person, it's three, four rows. So the, now, is, is, is that what a mixed room should also actually so be So that's doing? actually a very good question for tomorrow's session, because this is exactly what Bhaskar plans to talk about. Uh, how do you build a mixed room for Dolby Atmos? <laughs> I think he's the right person to answer that as well. Ladies do you have any other questions? No. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, any more questions? Last one, if you have any. There's a question here. Sure. Sir. Uh, Srijesh. <laughs> there are like uh, different, different format, different, different uh, configurations. People ah, I can't hear you very clearly. Yeah. Uh, like there are different, different uh, configurations people are using for Dolby Atmos. So I am just asking like uh, what should be the minimum, like what should be the ideal configuration for Atmos like uh, like someone is using 5.1.2 or 7.1.4. Every uh, single mix uh, I I hear from different different is like like a huge difference. So See the standard requirement is 7.1.4. 7.1.4. Yeah. And anything you build from there. Mm -hmm. 5.1.2 is a broadcast specification. 5.1.4 actually, there's not 5.1.2. 5.1.4 is a broadcast specification. for. TV based broadcast and things like that. And but if you if you're planning music or OTT, it is seven one four. That is the standard. And um, beyond that seven by seven point one. You can go four. beyond. There's okay. no problem with that. But the minimum requirement is seven one four. Going beyond depends on the size of your room, your budget, and you know there's a lot so, of things. Uh, I'm not uh, saying about the uh, system like uh, it's the minimum requirement. I'm I'm just uh, asking your view like uh, what should be the minimum configuration. Like okay, so there's a lot of things when it comes to that, and it's a slightly more technical thing. Mm -hmm. So when we look at uh, like a 714 room is good. It's a good room to start with. When you go into 914, you have to look at arraying, or 916, you have to look at arraying. Because your beds, if you don't have arrays, your beds will only play back from the middle portion of your top speakers. It won't play back from the front or the back. So then you start arraying. Again, I, this, this will digress very quickly, but I'll hold it back. The reason you need to look at arraying is also when you st when you have arraying implemented, you will not have the binaural response implemented in that. You cannot have a headphone monitoring. So, so you can't switch between these two. So if it depends on what you want to do. If your room is big, you will need 914, 916 just to address that width. If your room is small, go for a 714. There is a minimum specification for a room as well, which they'll discuss tomorrow. Yeah. Just one more. From your point, it's a right wing. From my point, it's a left wing. <laughs> yeah, uh, my question is like when starting off with the Atmos uh, mix for music, uh, would you recommend mixing in stereo first and setting like the proper foundation and then sort okay. of upscaling it to Atmos or directly? That's yeah. a very good question. Uh, that's a question that's often been asked. So there's a very clear answer for that. I can and when I, when I say a very clear answer, it's my point of view. I've done both. It's, if you know that the delivery is going to happen in Atmos at some point, start off on the Atmos mix. And the reason for that is if you do your stereo mix, you do everything, you do a lot of these processing and everything, and you go into the Atmos, you start placing things, you start spatializing things, and then you hear the binaural version of that versus the stereo version, of, they'll be drastically different. They have to sound different, otherwise we can just give the stereo mix for the binaural version. Why make a binaural in the first place? When you start mixing in Atmos, you have all of the opportunity to use this near, mid, and far, or off. You have all of the opportunity to position this. You have all of the opportunity to find out phase relationships and everything that is there before you make a 
stereo version out of that. And that's always how I've been making a stereo version of my mixes. So I do an Atmos mix. Uh, I, I have my beds uh, off for any binaural processing. I have very specific objects for near, mid, and far. And I take a binaural output of that. And the reason I take a binaural output of that is I use very specific objects for distance, which I'm fine when it comes in stereo. This will not break down on speakers. The breakdown on speakers happens is when your entire mix is in that way. So you have a combination of a, 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 um, of a binaural based mix and a biphonic mix. When you mix that and you create a stereo mix, you will get a stereo that will represent your Atmos mix very close, which also translates very well in binaural. So I do a Atmos mix, I take the binaural render and I master that. Which makes sense to have a renderer actually, an RMU rather than a, um, uh, uh, the um, production suite because you'll have to go through multiple steps for that uh, in this kind of a workflow. No, it's interesting. Do we have so time? We are running behind schedule. Okay, okay. I think this Just will be the last, last question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned the Fletcher Munson curve. Okay. So obviously in playback, it is the loudness compensation curve. You'll have to compensate in the loudspeaker for that. That's on a frontal lobe, the way the HRTF and the, mm. the impulse response of the head transfer. Yeah, yeah. How does it change for the other part of the bed layer versus the spatial layer? Does the Fletcher Munson curve still have a very large effect on this? Or does the effect change dramatically? I'm not saying lessens or it decreases. Does it change dramatically? I know it changes in real life. But in playback, in a controlled environment, what is the difference between real life versus uh, encoding slash decoding? Right. So in, in a controlled environment, you're basically uh, alleviating all kinds of external factors there. So at that point of time, anything and everything that you do is an artistic expression. Now, the amount of impact that a Fletcher Munson curve has, Fletcher Munson curve is ideally based from a frontal based uh, signal measurement. The reason uh, HRTF and all of those things came into play was when you started measuring what the surrounds do to your pinnas. There is only so much data that is available in terms of the HF boost that happens to the, uh, sorry, the HF shadowing that happens because it is very, um, is very subjective. It is extremely subjective. I mean, it also changes if you have hair or not. It's that subjective. So there is, uh, the Fletcher Munson curve is taken as a standard for the loudness measurement as it is. That is not going to change. What changes is the amount of uh, response you will have on the HF when you start putting it on the speakers itself. And when you start mixing, you're already taking that decision based on what you're listening. So if you're in a controlled environment, the good thing is you're listening to an artistic representation of what the mix engineer intended. But if it's not, if it's like a real home space and things like that, that is a place where you've already heard sounds before and you know what to expect, the a priori part of our uh, listening that happens. At that point of time, Fletcher mentioned does not really play a role in that, um, your back responses or anything. It's just you know this is how your home sounds like, this is what it will be. It's an a priori thing. But in a controlled environment, you'll be hearing the artistic impression. And I don't think we need to get very conscious about how much of these things need to put, uh, we need to put and we don't need to put because, you know, if it sounds good to your mix, it's, it sounds good and that's how I think we decide on that. Which is very dif different for sound design for films. It's the bang opposite of this. <laughs> Clock ticks are louder than the bus. I think we are ready to close this. Thank uh, you ladies so much. and gentlemen, uh, please thank Mr. Srijesh Nair for his presence today. I like to call upon Mr. Uh, I like to call upon Ms. Smita Rai, Deputy Project Director of Palm Expo, to give Mr. Srijesh Nair a token of appreciation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay back for our next session on converging technologies that reinforces live events of the future by Fijay Sablo. Thank you. <laughs>